I hope we're live. <laughs> I always love catching him out. He's just like, what is going on? <laughs> he's, he can't hear us yet because he's here we just go. putting himself just in. Putting my gear on. Getting ready. <laughs> Phone off. Apologies. We're normally way more organized than this. It's the heat, Brent. Is that right? <laughs> heat, yeah, that's what it is, right? We, we are live. Are they listening to us? Um, well, just a few. I think most of them yeah. think that we're not going to be live. So, yeah. oh, no, look, they're all in. I'm ready. <laughs> Tor Hoops. Tor Hoops. It, that looks like a new name for me, Tor Hoops. Very good. It First is. in. Oh, Rachel Mack in well fifth done. position today. Rachel Mack, she won't be happy with that. She will She'll not be, be happy so with that. Yeah. She will. Brad, where are you? You are not in your usual uh, studio. Where about you? Spare bedroom. No, no. I'm actually, uh, it's probably a little bit echoey. I don't know. It's, uh, I'm That's actually good. in a place in um, Cornwall, um, near Padstow, yeah. opposite side of the yeah. estuary, um, enjoying, thankfully, cooler weather than I would be at home. At the moment, oh. my daughters are doing a sterling job of looking after the goats in just under 40 degree heat. So, Whoa. Um, good on them. Whoa, <laughs> 40 degree heat in, in the higher parts of England. My God. And do you, know, do you know what blessed thing happens? So, just before I come away, just after um, I'd been on the last broadcast, yep. did, I tell you, did I tell you about the... Um, kid, I did. I must have told you about the kid. Must have been just before the last broadcast. About so goats. one of my goats escaped into the mail pen back in oh. February. Okay. Uh, not, not the males escaping into their pen. She yeah. escaped into yeah. the mail pen. A little baby. And so here we go. All of a sudden, I've now got a kid in late July. <laughs> so, well, a kid with a kid. Whoa! <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Well, obviously, one of my yeah. one of my uh, does has now turned into a nanny. So she is yeah. um, she's currently nursing a newborn at home with my daughters watching over them. In the so heat. Them. And what do what do what do uh, goats do in the chronic heat? Where do they go? Oh well, they just well. The good news is the field they've got lots of shelters, lots of yeah. shade, lots of water. You know, so they're able to sort of find themselves where they want to be. So there's none of this out in a baking field with yeah. nothing uh, there. I mean, let's face it, many people would consider them fairly hardy. You see all of these, you know, um, African of. countries with you know, goats, the goats yeah, out. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you've got to think, actually, some of those goats are also under the tree, yeah. you know, in the absolute heat of the day. Yeah, um, yeah they've got ways of monitoring their heat. And they... they actually don't take a lot of water relatively speaking they um yeah. unlike cows which take liters and liters if they're milking um you know the goats aren't so bad so uh, yeah. yeah pretty, what cow, pretty what about cows, and, cows and particularly sheep i mean obviously sheep have a lot of their coats removed but even still that lower coat still be um but even when it's shorn would be hot enough what do they do do they shut <laughs> <away? Do> they <laughs> <graze laughs> the goats oh, oh my god sheep <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she goats. <laughs> so they've got rid of my, their their winter coats of my goats. So that's really useful. Yeah. Um, I did make uh, because as I was trying to shear the alpaca uh, ready for the heat wave, um, unfortunately the goat was also delivering the kids. So I was a little bit distracted. The alpaca wow. started to get upset because he knew something else was going on. So he was spitting. So he was in a halter <laughs> spitting cool. at me. So I left him with the weirdest haircut ever. And I do apologize yeah. to my daughter. She, she sent me a photo and said, Dad, what have you done? Thank God you yeah. don't cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I've, something, I've, something of a, I've something of a Wallace and Gromit image of you, try, of this alpaca running down the field. And you, whoa, Betsy, slow down. <laughs> and then eventually, eventually giving up halfway through. Um, do you actually have to restrain the alpaca while you, while you, or does he just willingly come along for a hairdo? Uh, no, no, you have to. Well, he willingly comes along, but he really did not want to have his hair clipped. No. Um, okay, he was uh, especially when I started with a stripe right up his back, just to really yeah. make him look like a fool. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> Reverse mohawk. Uh, but anyway, here is your first mohawk. Yeah. But it's so thick. 
that coat yeah. is so thick hey, on alpacas. But Top actually, this brings us into a really good point to, that we've got to talk about tonight, which is yeah. to clip or not to clip. Oh, okay, indeed. So we must we must deal with that. So many people yeah. have been asking. Uh, so many other forums are asking. And I've got a take on this. And there's a couple of other well-known resources that have talked about it. So, yeah, yeah we've, we've, we've got some about that there. Tonight. And a lot of our followers are like small business owners. We've got a lot of groomers, pet shop owners. So yeah. any groomers that are here and uh, you've got an opinion on some of the things we're talking about, particularly when we start talking about coats and whatnot, Please give it to us. You guys are surrounded yeah, by, us, by it all day. And yeah. uh, you'll notice we are Raw Pet Medics, um, and uh, we Patreon.com is where you'll find us. Patreon.com forward slash Raw Pet Medics. And that's where uh, you can leave us the price of a cup of tea or coffee if uh, you like what you're hearing or if you just feel sorry for us. Uh, also, Nick is uh, in absentee, but while he's gone, he has given us a video uh, of his beach bum kind of stuff that he's doing, and he is talking, giving us some cool info on adders. Uh, which was very news to me, I have to say. We don't have a lot of snakes in Ireland, but I did see a lizard recently, not too far from my home, little tiny green lizard, Whoa. which, uh, yeah, so that's a lot for us because we don't have many of these sorts of uh, creatures here in on this island. But uh, so that'll be put up on Patreon. So that's the sort of stuff we're trying to do for Patreon as a thanks uh, for the help that you're, that you're giving us. So we appreciate all that. So, uh, yes, anyway, absolutely. Connor. Tell us what you had going on because you've had an eventful week. You know, I, I think you need to share it with the guys out there. I need to get it out. I need to get it Go out. On. Go um, on, vent, okay. vent. First of all, the drama. I was in a little bit of a car accident, and uh, it was uh, it was not nice. I, I think I've been in I've been in a few before where I've been in the back seat passenger, and a couple, you know, you know, impressive enough. But this one was was particularly impressive. Blind corner and. Uh, and pulling out and uh, not great. So a bit of a shocker, but I was more interested in kind of analyzing myself afterwards to the kind of delayed shock of it all, where people are asking, are you okay? And you know, the front foot of the car was in a disarray. It's terrible to see, terrible to hear, obviously. And then you're, uh, you know, and you're, you can't get out of the car and you realize your seatbelt is on. But for the next three or four hours, I, I was getting words wrong. I was trying to tell uh, my wife Elaine where like there was, you know, it, it's on top of the, um, the thing in the bedroom, we've one thing in the bedroom, there's like a bed and a dresser. And I couldn't get dresser out. So it's on top of that, not the bed. It's not not the bed. The, uh, and I couldn't get these words out. And I found that very, very interesting. And people are asking me for days after, you included, Brent, uh, how are you doing? And is everything all right? And I see, I'm grand, guys. Would you like, you know, I'm Irish, you know, just bury that deep down. Don't, don't face your emotions. And uh, so I was in a funk. I was in a real funk for four or five days, as Karen Reed will probably testify to. And uh, yeah, strange effect that I could. Um, yeah, it was quite quite a shocker. So you had mentioned something to me, aconite. Tell me why I should be taking aconite in a situation. Oh, so so really, you know, for anybody out there, especially if you're in an accident and your pets are with you, you know, this and they seem to be changed after that accident. Um, you know, aconite just for the shock value, the sudden change, that massive flow of anxiety, aconite can be a really useful remedy. Okay. Um so see your homeopath, you can get high potencies, but even for those that can't find a homeopath or aren't local to one, a lot of the first aid kits will at least have a 30C um, potency in them. Uh, and it's a really good remedy for shock. Okay. So how, do we take uh, it? how do we take it? How much of us, uh, like how often? Literally, you can just take a tablet, uh, uh, suck the pill under your tongue or crush it if you're going to tip it into the side of the dog's mouth or cat's mouth um, and literally just let it dissolve there. Uh, for a 30C, you might need to take maybe even up to six doses in that first day just to you know get through. But even if it's a week after, you can... Just go, okay, I sort of cope, but I'm still having flashbacks or, you know, I'm still, my pets are still changed. They're doing different things and they seem overly scared. You know, just go down to um, looking at twice daily for five days or oh, so. Okay? Um, and yeah. that's a, a, an easy way to, to use that. So that's A-C-O-N-I-T-E, so aconite, okay? It's aconite. a really useful one. And of course, there is also a really useful remedy um, for those people that like to bury things, okay, that really think that they can cope. A very Irish sentiment, okay? Yeah. And, and actually, it's a, um, a disease that's um, 
does the same thing in its own right and it buries itself okay walls itself off from the immune system and that's tuberculinum okay Ooh. so that can be a really useful remedy uh for those people that really truly bury things okay wow. to try and avoid that but they always want to be out you know they can be quite outgoing quite gregarious looking but yet actually you know they want to escape yeah. But actually, they like to bury stuff. Okay, so oh, that so, might be a remedy so, for you. Well, like it, it might be, but like even the, the fact that they call it tuberculosis, because tuberculosis is buried down into the liver, yeah. isn't it? Liver, yeah, is uh, that is lung, lung, lung. It's a lung thing, of course. Okay, yeah. so but so but isn't it interesting that the thing that you know it's buried down there, and so that might be useful for people that are burying emotions. I just think that's fascinating. Who came up with this? Who could possibly? Well, oh, do you know, the there is. are huge tomes of books writing about this stuff. You know, people say, oh, it's all a bit of flim flam and, you know, there's not much research into it. God, guys, there are tomes, there are volumes and volumes of people noting down cases and their response to certain um, remedies yeah. uh, and also what remedies do to prove. So, I mean, it, yeah. it's... You know, it is nowhere near flim flam. There is just so much stuff out yeah. there to say, um, you know, look at these provings, we call them, you know, to, to how remedy, uh, remedies that's will cool. act, etc. So, so that, yeah, so that's good. Would, would it, be, would it yeah, be useful? So a dog that's been attacked, I just had a terrible case of a dog that had been attacked by a pity in New York and the pity was holding onto the dog's neck. So a real proper aggressive attack. And that dog in, in mega shock after it. And uh, so would you use aconite then? Is that the sort of... Aconite, that, absolutely. Aconite is a first line. Arnica is also a really good shock remedy. So where there is actual physical injury mm -hmm. as well as emotional injury, yeah. Arnica can be really useful. A lot of people don't um, literally see the um the sort of mental shock of um uh, arnica as, as that bigger thing but actually it's huge in the remedy okay yeah. so never write since an accident okay uh if it's a, even if it's a mental um change arnica can be really useful yeah too. yeah that's interesting. and that can be a, an attack you know as you've just described yeah. um it can be you know falling off something and you know having a big bang it could be you know being daft and running into a tree you know we've seen dogs that do yeah. that um as they're trying to chase yeah. sticks and stuff like that you know yeah. it's uh, dealing uh, dealing with down, some, dealing with dealing with some terrible news dealing with some terrible events yeah you know yeah, what I mean? yeah absolutely yeah things like that that can really be an emotional shock too yeah yeah so I didn't take any of those things to be an artist. I was like, no, I'll just ignore it and uh, I'll have a gin and tonic. And <laughs> I'm there know. giving him excellent yeah. advice yeah. over WhatsApp. And what does he do? Yeah. Ignores yeah. me. Have a gin and tea. <laughs> and oh, and now he comes on tonight going, I'm still yeah. in the yeah. <laughs> oh, but, uh, And then uh, there, was one, there was one other thing, although I, I do want to get to the show, there was one other thing where after we talked about byproducts last week, it was interesting that one of the, what I would consider white coats, one of the um, forefront kind of vets that do a lot of talking for the industry, uh, uh, to, to the great benefit of the industry and, and possibly themselves, um, it was then talking about the benefits of why byproducts are such a fantastic ingredient for pet food. And I kind of thought, well, that's not exactly what we said because I kind of felt that that post came out after we mentioned byproducts. I just want to set the record straight that byproducts in tiny little bits, a little bit of this and a little bit of that from you know the extremities, not the end of the world, you know. But, but for um, you know, when they list the byproducts that can go into pet food, blood is siphoned off. That's not a that's not a byproduct that goes into pet food. Blood is used in a, in a myriad of of industry uses. Uh, so that doesn't go in there. Bone goes for rendering, so that doesn't go in. The good quality organs are gone for food. You know, you're left with with, with you know heads and and arse essentially, and and with with good contents. So it's kind of like how much of that do you want in your diet? Well, like a little bit, not a whole lot. To say it's a really quality ingredient. A little bit misleading and i did i did find it very interesting that this white coat said after all wolves go for the stomach contents first and i thought oh how interesting i said we're not talking about wolves are we why do we be talking about wolves because it's exactly the sort of person that gives out for comparing dogs to wolves and here they are saying erroneously that dogs go for stomach contents they absolutely do not she has not got a single reference to support that point it was rubbish but it was well shared and well liked by our followers and i thought um, I thought that was very interesting. Anyway, yeah, Brad, we put this to bed, didn't we? Because we said that actually they may go for organs mm -hmm. within, 
um, the abdomen, but they don't necessarily go for the gut no, content. Definitely not. The and belly. that's the difference. And let's yeah. let's face it: that a lot of the meat and animal derivatives are often the bits that they wouldn't be able to sell any other way. And yeah. and let's face yeah. it: liver and kidney often oh, go off for resale. Yeah, so you know they're primal. All of us. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're left yeah. with intestinal tract. And so they might take small intestinal tract, but to suggest they eat, like, we've got lots of videos of cows, of dogs bringing down cows and sheep. They never eat the tribe, ever. They never take, they pull the belly out and then they get at the organs, but they never eat the belly. So they don't take the belly away and leave the grass in a pile. Uh, they don't. Hyenas, mice that I've seen, but I've never seen a mm -hmm. video of a domestic dog doing it or a wolf. They just leave it there. It's just full of grass. Who wants that? Anyway, Bren, <laughs> hot, we're talking about hot dogs. Get us started. What's the story with hot dogs? dogs uh, what sort of dogs can overheat what are we who are we talking about here yeah well look um there are one or two particular breeds that we are especially worried about okay um but in this for those breeds that are within let's say the uk you know we're we're experiencing really high temperatures for the uk right now record-breaking temperatures um and you know realistically those dogs are not really acclimatized, pretty much like our railways. You know, they're not really acclimatized to working at this temperature. There are going to be some dogs around the world which are much more acclimatized to uh, high temperatures. Um, and even then, those dogs are going to be more sensible about what, what they do. You yeah. know, in the middle of the day, you know, we're not going to expect them to be running a, a mock doing, you know, lots of hard work and thinking that everything is hunky-dory and fine. So I think particularly the ones which find it hard to heat exchange are going to be the ones where the airways okay. are compromised. Yeah. OK, so, you know, for the normal panting to happen, you've got to have the soft palate lift out of the way. You've got to have good airflow uh, going uh, through the the mouth so that they can properly heat exchange through um, the the tongue vessels okay um, and we know that brachycephalic breeds long soft palate they can't really move it out of the way the often the air is diverted away from the tongue so they find it really hard to heat exchange they also you know if you then run those dogs around um, in the middle of the day and we're talking about look we're not talking about air temperature alone here so a lot of people got confused when I talked about, you know, between 18 and 21 degrees is optimal. That's all of the textbooks say for dogs in an inpatient environment where they can't control their own temperature. 18 to 21 is the best temperature to keep your clinic at, to keep your ward at, to keep them safe in that environment without them getting okay. hyperthermia or hypothermia. Okay. Okay. So we talk about if they are ill or compromised in their ability to heat exchange and you are above 21 degrees and then you add into that radiant heat from the sun okay mm -hmm. so i.e you don't give them shelter you don't give them shade you stick them out both the sun beating down on them but also the warmth of the pavement beating back up underneath them then your risk of overheating that patient and that is where hyperthermia and excessive heat can be really problematic. OK, okay. Um, so definitely brachycephalics. So boxers all the way through to bulldogs, um, Boston Terriers, you know, French bulldogs, all of those breeds that we think about. If it's got a squashed nose or if it's got laryngeal paralysis. Remember back mm, to, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Karen was coming on mm. and, and talking as, to us about laryngeal paralysis anything that interrupts their normal heat exchange could compromise that patient in the heat of the day yeah. so all i asked was yeah. please guys help out your vet try yeah. to keep the, your dogs away from the heat of the day especially between 11 and 4 so everywhere you go on the continent they talk about that's the time of day yeah. to avoid the sun okay yeah. and then you know for but those particular breeds even consider first thing in the morning walks, last thing at night walks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And if there's ways to cool them down in water, you know, give them. I love a little green turtle um, sort of yeah. sand pit that that 
is hard plastic because then you can fill that with water um, instead of sand. And my dogs don't puncture the bottom of it the first time yeah. they dive in yeah. um, and dig at it. So yeah. that could be really useful just to let them in. I know there's going to be some people out there with pools of their own. Brilliant, you know, but in the UK, we don't generally tend to have those. Yeah, uh, no. So give them an opportunity uh, to get yeah. into water or to wet them down. Yeah. And I've got some tips coming up on best ways to cool them down um, if needs be um, yeah. in a hurry. Yeah, okay. definitely. And like, so what's what are the signs like hypothermia? What, what's it do to you? What happens when you get too hot? I mean, what is there any sort of physiology there we need to know about? Or is it just we all know what happens when you get too hot? Yeah. So you get all sorts of triggers that happen. OK, uh, firstly, you know, dehydration. OK, yeah. so you tend to uh, go into water loss. Um, your body's trying to compromise things. Um, the, the muscles are releasing uh, lots of uh, extra carbon dioxide into the system. You're going to start to get acidosis. Um, you can sometimes get your um, trigger zones of the brain, which uh, affect nausea to start vomiting. That further acts on fluid loss. Um, and that can mean that the salt levels within your system get compromised. That can also affect you know, brain function. So you can get neurological see, you know, syndromes with yeah. staggering, even seizures. Um, you can you will get um, you know the consequences of having an acidosis um, and dehydration alone. The organ damage and the pain that can be associated with that um, is 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 massive. So yeah, really, really, you know, it can be heart stopping stuff. Okay, yeah. so um, it isn't just a, oh they got a bit hot and they need a fan yeah. on them and that yeah. should be fine. Yeah. Um, there are some really interesting things people talk about. Do they ice the dog? Okay, do they chuck ice on the dog? Do they, um, you know, cool the skin down with cold freezing water? Now, ultimately, if you've got them in a bath of cold water that is circulating and constantly um, cooling them down, you might think, well, they will cool down eventually, and they will. But the downside is in that initial process, you will shut down their peripheral vasculature, okay, the yeah. vessels. And what that means is that they stop heat exchanging through the skin because all the blood is then centralized. So their core temperature stays high. Wow. So they kind of struggle to, heat, to, to do the heat loss adequately, quickly enough. Wow. So actually better putting on um, a tepid water, putting fans on them and getting the water to evaporate. To take oh, that's into. cool. That's a great okay. tip. I so so oh a God. lot of people get worried about this whole ice thing, you know, uh, internal ice. OK, so that would work, would help. But you've got a dog that's probably vomiting, probably yeah. got some neurological problems, struggling, in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. often yeah. often struggling to, to heat exchange through their mouths and panting yeah. like crazy. You're not going to cram ice creams down yeah. it. Now, if it's getting warm and it's got no other symptoms, then obviously giving them something cold to eat is not a problem i've done yeah. a little video i'll post it on facebook yeah. you know giving my dogs some of the frozen mints oh, is yeah, not a problem. Yeah. okay um it's you know they can perfectly happily eat some of the frozen yeah. raw food uh, without any problems whatsoever Absolutely. um that's a good way of just giving them a way to to cool down yeah. um don't overdo it because the body can sometimes try to compensate and then go into this overdrive and somebody reported that that's what dogs would do but generally that's only if it's on a cold day and you give them something cold the body would respond to warm itself up very homeopathic thing to do actually okay how to warm yourself up on a cold winter's day is give yourself a dose of cold and your body will should respond and overwhelm that feeling that's a homeopathic what? principle so, so on a cold from, day i'm supposed to eat an ice pop to heat up if if your body is working well you can stimulate yourself to warm up by giving yourself a dose of cold no way yeah you that will feel warmer nice. So if you I'll go out, I'll go out for a cold sure. swim. So the classic, so ask those people that do the cold swim yeah. thing. Okay. And then when yeah. they get out, yeah. they very quickly yeah. warm up. 
Yeah. I, now, I this actually, is not about staying in the iced water for three hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get no. hypothermia. This I'm, is I'm get, quick yeah. dip. I, I, I subscribe to that for sure because what I do, uh, uh, if you know, you've got the few bits of gym that you're doing, but uh, is the you know the sauna and the plunge pool, the the, the cold water. And there's a the study came out there a few months ago. Uh, from the Scandinavian lady, who else is going to produce it but a Scandinavian? And they're showing why you know they love these. Everyone's got a got a got a sauna, and so the sauna gets uh, feels quite hot, you know. So uh, you jump into this plunge pool, and she was saying you need to move it around a bit because if you stay stationary, you heat up the water in a film around you, and you need to move it around to keep it cool to brush that warm water off you, as you just mentioned about the cool air off the dock. So that's perfect. Get rid of that a little bit, and she says three minutes four times a week is the magic number and while yes it does increase metabolism a little bit which is good news if you're trying to lose weight and whatever uh, the big thing is the is the kick in endorphins and those sort of neurotransmitter type cool compounds two and a half times and they realize it lasts for hours so you get this it's the cold which your body's producing these endorphins to say, you know, you're okay, you're having a good time, you're fine. And uh, but for hours afterwards, and I've seen it working in a couple of my friends who had a few little mental wobbles and into the cold sea, you know, 10, 20, 30 days in a row, and they were different people. They were off the things that had been prescribed. So, uh, yeah, that cold water stuff yeah. is, is amazing. But for you to recommend that on a cold day, it goes completely against my Irish principles of drinking as much hot tea as you possibly can. But really, it's, <laughs> that surely the, is it. On the reverse, on the reverse, this is why in India, drinking hot tea is a great cooling thing because it yeah, stimulates your yeah. body to do all of the things like produce sweat to... My mum says you know, that. That's mad. Fight, fight against it to cool yourself down. So, yeah, yeah you know, having a, a cup, not 15 cups, but a yeah, cup Yeah, I was going to say, my mum's a terrible just, addict. So right. she, has to have, <laughs> and she doesn't get the tea. God help you if you're around. I'm a complete addict for tea. And so like, you know, whatever, five, seven cups of tea a day. And so on cold days, it has benefits. And on hot days, it has benefits. And I imagine that's something like a heroin addict probably says. It's like, oh, it's just great for everything. It's just like, well, it's because you're addicted to it. Uh, so, so yeah, that's it. That, so that ice thing, just to go back. So just for those people out there, something called hormetic stressors are meant to be really in at the moment, okay, as a way of longevity, building longevity for ourselves and as Connor rightly said really there is an optimum probably three times a week that you need a hormetic stressor now cold water bathing things like that is a hormetic stressor yeah Wim Hof I think has been mentioned already on the, the thing yeah. um, but you yeah, shouldn't you do it every day because if you do it every day your body actually goes into a chronic stress metabolism it produces loads of cortisols all of the time it makes you insulin resistant it starts to switch off all sorts of mechanisms and flips your whole sympathetic parasympathetic balance out so whatever it is whether it's fasting whether it's cold bathing whether it's um you know strenuous exercise yeah. you should yeah. limit those a little bit of one. yeah that, yeah a little bit of something little, yeah. is far better for you than yeah. trying to do a marathon every day that's yeah. a real stressor okay yeah. you're, you're a real we always do we always rate. latch on to something we find something that works and then some people just do it to infinity and it's like well that's probably not uh the most useful application of that um so so tell me so let's say i've got a hot dog bren uh, what are the options for keeping our dogs cool in a hot climate? Yeah, so um, I've got a few things that, I mean, definitely, look, we're talking about beach bum here. I've got, you know, I'm down by the coast, um, bought this ages ago. Fortunately, we're actually in one of the coolest spots of the UK right now because uh, we've just had some rain flush through and it's just cooled things down. So we're back into the low 20s. So that's Lovely. all good. But, you know, um, taking my dogs down for a swim early morning, late evening. Um, I've got a little video I'll post of them. In fact, I think for tonight I posted my dogs um, swimming late last night. Um, and uh, yeah, think about that. Do it safely, okay? If you're going to take your dogs for a swim, so really interesting. Favorite dog toy for Artie, and um, we literally saw that yesterday morning get sucked under by a riptide 
So oh. really, guys, be careful wherever you are, okay? Um, just check what's going on. It's a, a great surfing beach it was, but they, you know, the tide was going out and literally just just went under the water as it was thrown in and, you know, not six foot from where I was because I was just testing the water and literally saw the tide just suck it out underwater. So immediately put the dogs on the lead out of the water, you know, we're not going to take them swimming there. So be safe wherever you are. Be warned. You know, there are some of those, even if they're really good swimmers, which my dogs are, you know, they, they will swim and swim and swim. They're really good swimmers. Have, but uh, I will not risk them in that environment. Labradors have webbed feet and uh, big oar like tails because that's kind of what they're kind of designed to do. But that's it's a different animal when you're getting sucked out and uh, he's just trying to get in, you know, so you can't tell him, no, swim to the side, Artie, and all the other instructions <laughs> that he might benefit from. But, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, just they don't are swimming, it. Breathe, but don't risk it. Yeah, definitely, no. Yeah. Mm, yeah, so uh, so that's one thing. I would definitely say early mornings, late evenings, get them in water if you can. There's another great uh, person who um, does a lot of posts from the Lake District. Um, so it's Max in the Lake District and he's got Spaniels, you know, fortunately blessed with rivers everywhere. You know, even if it's those safe rivers that you can just get them into, let them cool down. I think anything like that is really good. Yeah. Water in your back garden, if you don't have those luxuries nearby, um, is also great. The next thing, there's a couple of bits. So we've got these so some people may have seen them they're like a gel mat okay um and they basically are um a cooling mat so your dog can lie on them i saw somebody post this with their dog basically the mat on the bed and the dog laid off on the soft um yeah. duvet to one yeah. side of it saying what's yeah. that for um but actually for many dogs i mean they will either find a cold floor like a tile floor or something like that um or they'll find one of those they actually will seek that if they are warm enough so have a look at um you know those mats as an option if you don't have a tiled floor anywhere yeah and also remember your house should be reasonably insulated so don't necessarily open everything up unless there's a really good wind shut everything down close the curtains insulate your house like and that is far more likely to keep it cool mm. through the heat of the day than opening everything up on a still day and the warm air yeah. just seeping in if anyone's got a, if anyone's got a baby like you know the baby's not digging this really hot temperature so you learn very quickly the sun comes down behind our house and streaming in the windows and if you let that happen and then you bring the kid upstairs to go to bed at seven o'clock in the evening the room was 31 degrees it only got up to 27 but the room was like 31 and it's baking hot so what you learn at lunchtime is you shut the blinds so when the sun comes over the house it's just bouncing off the blinds and that's the heat you want to avoid it's interesting when you said about the tiles how many of us listening now be honest how many of us listening think tiles are colder than carpets or wood or cork and we think that tiles are colder i certainly spent the first 30 years of my life believing that tiles were cold but actually, what they are is excellent conductors, obviously. So when you step on a cold tile or a lion, if you're a dog, it sucks the heat out of you good and quick, as opposed to a carpet or wood, uh, you know, very poor conductors. So we don't have wires made of wood and carpet and whatnot. So they don't suck the heat away, so your feet stay warm. So when you're walking around the carpet and cork tiles, it's lovely. And then you walk into the bathroom, it's like, oh, those tiles are cold. Well, you're supposed to think they're excellent conductors of uh, of heat, but nobody thinks that. So I bet a few people thought, I thought tiles, because like, it's not like a substance has some way of staying cold or else your fridge would be made of it, wouldn't it? You know? but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> side, side note, I always, there's a few people that were caught with that. I want them to admit it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely would say, you know, um, watch the underfloor heating, make sure that's not on. But other than that, because you've conducting warm air into the, the rooms. But realistically, you will want to have your dogs inside, cooled, you know, maybe put fans on. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Give them plenty of access <coughs> to water to stay hydrated. OK, so that's number one. Keep them as hydrated as possible, regardless of any other thing, because that's bottle. what's going to help them. I've got so, the same bottle, I mean, Brent. Does, that, does it have a button and it flips up? Yeah, I've got the same. <laughs> I just bought it. 
That's weird. I don't have it handy. I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you. <laughs> nuts. Anyway. Um, All right, brother. What about, what about, what about, uh, what about sc- sunscreen for dogs, Bren? Is there such a thing? And how do you feel about sunscreen? Yeah, so, okay. So most dogs shouldn't need sunscreen. And I think this is, you know, because they're, they're pretty well haired um, all the way up or they've got very dark areas. Now, there are some dogs which may have had um, a, an autoimmune disease, which has left the pigment removed from uh, their noses, from around their eyes, uh, from, you know, other dark, you know, skinned areas. Or, or they may have, in fact, lost their hair for one or two reasons uh, as well. And if they do do that, then realistically you do want to protect them now for most people that would be keeping them out of the sun giving them shade to stay in and trying to keep them in that shaded area um, even if it's to some degree penning them into a, a shaded area um, you know realistically there are some screens that you can apply um, I have a natural one here it's a human one, but it's only got natural ingredients in. So it's got none of the classic zinc oxides and, you know, other um, weird uh, things, sort of weird stuff in there. OK, so I, I will just show that up there. OK, yep. so they only go up to a maximum of 30 SPF because they find that's really good. But again, you've got to apply it frequently if you're going to apply it. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that on Friday. I'm going to talk about Friday in a moment, but. Um, because especially for cats that go out and sunbathe, um, can be really useful. And okay. when it's full of natural ingredients, that one I find safe, even yeah. if they groom it off to apply to the bridges of their noses and their ears, particularly the ears, yeah. uh, for squamous cell carcinoma. So the, the... Uh, certainly sunscreens are there. Realistically, the fur is the protectant. And yeah. therefore, this argument that is going on about do we clip? Don't we clip? Okay. I'm actually firmly in the don't clip camp. Okay. Only on the proviso that you don't exercise your dog because any internal heat generated will not be lost okay. easily. Mm. Okay. So if you've got a dog that's running around like a fool in the sunshine, okay, then yeah. Clipping might be the only way you're going to stop that, okay? Because you're going to have to uh, allow them to heat exchange through skin by applying stuff to their skin, um, you know, allowing the airflow past them, allowing them to get into water and, and cool off, you know, those sort of things. But realistically, even if they've got an outer guard coat, okay, which is long, which when the sun hits it, the outer part heats up, but they are trapping a cooler part of air which insulates them from that radiant heat, okay? That is the purpose of the coat, okay? Um, so really, that can be really useful for, you know, big dogs, um, even in the summertime. And this is why what tends to happen in the summertime is they don't sort of lose all of their coat. They tend to lose their undercoat, the, do, the yeah. thick, downy stuff. That's the fluff you find, yeah. The fluffy stuff. Yeah. So a lot of groomers will say what you should be doing is spending time grooming out that yeah. thick undercoat, okay? So they're just left with the nice. larger guard hair. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah. I remember groomers okay. saying the same thing. There's a, a certain comb that was all the rage, and there's many copies of it called the Furminator. And the, the Furminator's fine teeth, fine tooth to comb. Uh, but the amount of fluff it takes off your dog, my old dog, Meg, Shepherd's Cross, uh, Rough Collie, had the thickest undercoat. Like you'd swear she was a polar type dog. And uh, and every spring, that's the fluff you find, just really fine white hair everywhere. She was a black dog and the hair was white everywhere. And it took a while to cotton on. It's, oh, that's the stuff underneath. And you get a Furminator to her and there'd be a, like a dog of hair lying on the ground you know those images where people make dogs out of their hair mark roberts is always doing that with his huskies there's a typical breed with that sort of coat and so uh so yeah that sort of furminator tool was fantastic for removing the undercoat and that starts in spring as it starts to heat up and, and coming into summer yeah it's really important because they can't just shake it off themselves they can to, to a degree but it's getting hotter guys it's a fact and uh you can help them out by you see the hot weather coming and you you give your dog a solid grooming to get that that undercoat off if your breed has that undercoat quick google will tell you tell you that yeah, yeah. that tip went. 
So uh, I know there's a couple of people that are getting confused because there's people out there firmly in the clip off camp and there's people out there firmly yeah, in the yeah. clip off camp. Um, and I think I can understand that whole basis, but you know, ultimately heat exchange is about getting the heat from the body. Most dogs will do that through panting, but actually they will heat exchange through their skin if they're given the opportunity through you know evaporation. They don't have natural sweat from their skin to evaporate. It Therefore, the only way you can do that is to wet their coat down, let the, it evaporate, and then reapply. Oh, that's nice. And let that do like a little spray, a little spray of water, give, make the coat a little damp, and then let her move around a little bit. Just keep doing, just keep going. Ah, just, cool. yeah, like it that. doesn't even, even have to be, a, you could just hose them down, yeah, let them yeah. get a little bit damp, and then, you know, God, let it dry. Dudley loves it. Dudley loves a cocker spaniel, just loves it. I mean, he hasn't got... I mean, I, I slag him off all the time, but the dog really doesn't understand the difference between sun and shade. He'll just sit there in his patch and just bake. <sighs> and you have to kind of pick him up and move him into the shade and kind of say, sit in the shade, you eejit. So, like, you can't actually leave him outside by himself because I honestly don't trust him enough to, to move into the shade when he starts to overheat. But uh, yeah. there was somebody saying, what was the name of that natural sunscreen if you could hold it up there, Bren, just to, just to get that um, going again? And also, uh, people correctly mentioning about sunscreen. Yes, lads, there is a, a, a darker side to sunscreen. And I was sitting beside a Washington Post journalist in a, a gig we were doing up in Finland at uh, Anaheim Borgman's talk a few years ago. And she was a Washington Post journalist, and she was the person that is fronting this campaign about sunscreen. We've got mega problems in the sunscreen industry. They're not all the same. There's some really worrying chemicals uh, in the sunscreen. The Washington Post is who covers it the most, the, of these articles. And the one that I thought was pretty impressive was this one in 2017, what you need to know about the chemicals in your sunscreen. That was in 2019. Um, and it's pretty worrying and you can just imagine, you know, you, you can name them all. But the fact is your skin is the most absorptive organ you can possibly imagine. And a lot of those chemicals we now realize we are absorbing at a terrible rate, far higher and bioaccumulating them more than we thought. Uh, and now we know it's having an effect on fetuses. So there is that's this is not to say don't use sunscreen. It's to say get smart about the sunscreen you're using. Sunscreen skin cancer is a huge thing and it's very prevalent. You should be using some sort of protection in that respect. But that doesn't mean you use you have to use uh, shitty dodgy sunscreen when you can use good quality natural sunscreen. As Bren was saying, I'm sure there's a bevy of solutions there because they name the top three or four compounds that you have to be very, very careful of. A lot of them don't make the label. It's not like zinc oxide would be something that myself and Brian would know about, but these, we, we're getting into chemicals here called oxybenzone. Anything with benzene on it is mega carcinogenic. Oxybenzone is a huge one for pregnant women, uh, if that's in your sunscreen. And there's heavy science behind all these things. American Academy of Dermatology recommending against a lot of these products. Um, and over and over, overwhelming evidence. A lot of those, you know, and, and often derived from the petrochemical industry, you know, the organic yeah, yeah. Uh, chemicals, but they can be carcinogenic in their own right. You know, we're there sort of panicking about, you know, filtering out UVA and UVB, you know, to yeah. stop ourselves getting skin cancers, and then we're sticking on, you yeah. know, carcin carcinogenic chemicals. Yeah. It just doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more thing. I know we're getting close to the end here. There is yeah. one other thing um, just to say. I know that there are some dogs out there that just do not get it. They will be pests to chase a ball, to, you know, um, throw something, you know. And I've got one of those. I've got a spaniel who, you know, she will insist, yeah. don't care how hot it is, she would run and run and run until she literally dropped off. Um, the yeah. you know uh, uh, you know the heat register and just collapsed. Um, so things to uh, to consider is removing these from sight. Okay, of not only them but also people that like to use them. Okay, yeah. uh, especially in the heat of the day. Fine if you want to throw them something into the sea, you know, and you know, all the rest of it. But all the mice pops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but please, you know. These things, I've seen people stood at the top of steep hills, throwing the ball as far as they can to get the dog to run as far as they can while they just sit there, um, you know, eating an ice cream. Please yeah, think of these as really deadly in that situation. OK, yeah. you're running your dog into the ground. Um, so avoid that at all costs uh, yeah. in this heat.
Okay. I, I, um, I thought it was very interesting. I just wanted to pick up a comment that Karen mentioned earlier. Karen Reed has got a very interesting uh, syndrome. Would you call it a syndrome, Karen? Uh, where she go, she gets an anaphylactic shock response to cold. So if she goes into cold water. She she has had two or three times in her life an anaphylactic shock to it, which is more the extreme end of your allergic response. All allergies pretty pretty dramatic. Let's face it. But this is where you know this is the proper. Uh, scary stuff and she's had that two or three times in uh, response to cold water so it's not just hot we're talking about but on the opposite end of the spectrum you can have people uh, like Karen and I'm sure she's not on her own that have this kind of response to cold as well which I thought was was very very interesting and in relation, you actually mentioned earlier about dogs eating cold as well eating cold food guys over in Australia and a lot of the hot countries I'm sure in Texas and all sorts of places that are used to way higher temperatures than we are cold and frozen food is a very big part of these dogs diet they can handle it it takes much more energy energy to digest a cold meal but for sure it's going to cool you down it's going to take away some of that heat from inside small amounts of it. if you're you don't need to give your dog a, a kilo frozen food but you know a frozen duck neck will just be no problem to my cocker spaniel who enjoys it because my duck necks come in a flat bag i smash them over the ground i've got individual duck necks whoo, into the garden so they can have those frozen items and there's a million cool little treats you can make, you know, you, where you make um, cool ice cubes where you can fill them up water or broth and you can put one little treat in it. People are filling up like uh, plastic drinkable cups or cardboard drinkable cups and they put water in and two or three treats where the dog has to break apart the ice to get at the one or two or three treats inside. All those are perfectly good solutions. If you type in ice cube dog treat ideas and little natural yogurt with little bits of flavor and a blueberry, like incredible stuff. Uh, but like, in those silicone paw prints. Yeah. You know, you've got to make them yourself. Oh, it has come to be on. a paw print and bone shaped or the dog <laughs> yeah. won't know what to do with it. So, uh, but they look divine. So uh, and the, all that stuff is great for dogs. And there's the doggy ice pops. There's great uh, products out there that come in the freezers of supermarkets and they've got various names where they make these doggy ice pops. But guys, there's no, it's very simple stuff. If there's a banana and peanut butter one, it's yogurt with banana and peanut butter. It does not some you know, amazing kind of uh, scientific stuff behind it. It's very simple. Uh, so you can make this stuff yourself and your dog would absolutely love it. And you definitely can't feed it frozen on hot days. Small amounts, you know, feed right for the type and all that kind of stuff. For sure. Yeah. Any last and, thoughts, Brett? Last thoughts. Um, be safe. Be safe by, um, you know, the, the water. If you don't, if you have a dog that can swim well, I would still advocate one of these. Okay. Um, because it allows you to grip them and pull them out quickly, especially if there's any problems, uh, especially if there's riptides or anything like that. So I always advocate having one of these. I even actually have this because when they're swimming late at night, they can be seen where they are. How's so okay. the so dog use a whistle? A light. I don't, no, yeah, a I'm, only light. I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I love this. I love so, it. Artie had that on last night. So as she was swimming along, you could see her. Oh, that's um, so that, cool. But they actually do little life jackets for those that maybe aren't so competent. Okay. Uh, so just have a little look at those. Um, that would be something. So swim safe yeah. for your dogs yeah. uh, out there. Um, and uh, yeah, um, that's, that's really things. That I, the last bits are we've got a little bit on. Guess what this is? It's a douche it's it was backwards. Okay. Right. It's, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bladder. Okay, so we've got um, cats on Friday. So we, through popular demand, are doing a feline Friday. Okay, hashtag feline Fridays. Um, nice. With Dr. Uh, Amaya Espendola, um, uh, who's a vet currently in Spain, but she's a fell vet, so she's feline veterinary um, specialist. Um, and also uh, through popular demand, we've got uh, um, Julianne yeah. coming back. Yeah. Um, uh, so Julianne Thorne, who you saw a couple of weeks back, um, back. is coming back to join us. Uh, so uh, watch out. I'm going to post um, on RPM just after this. Um, there's a look. Well, there's quite a lot of things to post, actually, because there's going to be some information Ooh. from yes. Nick, because yep. Nick couldn't post tonight. So we've got a little video from him on adders. OK, and yeah. things to look out in the dunes around Cornwall. So it's really Really, inf lots of information there. Um, I've, so I've, I've do got a funny, follow funny this snake. video. 
a funny snake story. I was in there, I was in oh, Perth, yeah. Australia, and Perth has, you know, has snakes, has serious, serious snakes. And uh, in the outskirts, but you get some serious snakes inside the city, and the biggest, most impressive one is called the Dugite big black snake that's not a small snake it's a big snake and they're in the dunes and to get to the dunes the car parks are always separated from the beach by dunes particularly scarborough where we were living big surfer beach and uh so there'd be tiny little paths through the sand dunes and everybody walks through them so i'm there in the first couple of weeks you know and you're irish and you're red and you're carrying your 15 things down and you're like all the aussies just go down in shorts and whatever and I'm just coming down with all this apparel and it walk around my earphone, walk around, I don't know, whatever it was, an earphone. And I'm, I'm just carrying all this stuff and I'm totally distracted, right? And I'm walking down towards the beach by myself. And suddenly I look down and there's a massive snake on the ground. And I thought, Aussies just see snakes all the time. So I just, kept, I, I didn't even break my stride. I just stepped over and kept walking. And my heart was like, boom, boom, boom. But I wanted to act normal and cool and not stand out as a weird kind of paddy with all this stuff. And then like there's an Aussie couple behind me and they must have thought i was such a legend because they saw the snake and they went oh my god snake snake you're supposed to point it out to everybody and i just casually looked down and step over this massive brown snake on one of my first days there but uh yeah so anyway i'm going to be interested to listen to nick's team and also guys i have taken pictures of seven of the most common irish seaweeds that you're going to find not probably the most common i couldn't find one which is ridiculous because it's one of the most common uh which is quite ironic but uh, i found six or seven pretty little seaweeds and i'm going to be posting them up on patreon and if the person who names the most amount of them gives you the species name of the seaweed you're looking at a few green a few brown a few red beautiful and uh, i've numbered them one to seven and whoever gets the most correct in 24 hours can pick what they want from my shop okay so a uh, simple little quiz just for a bit of crack. Um, so that'll be posted up on Patreon after this. Okay. Great. Brilliant. So look forward to seeing some of you guys on Friday. Um, and uh, we're back next week with Q&A. So it's Q&A week next week. So yep. I think we're all back for that, aren't we? So yep, we're the three of us. Yep. Um, keep an eye out for um, Nick's um, video that's going to be posted on the Facebook page for um, Adder Treatments um, and uh, that side of things. And uh, yeah. Great yeah. to see you all. Good. Enjoy yourselves. Keep cool, guys. I hope you stay safe. Cheerio.